everyone, Jason Sherman here. In today's episode of Zero to CEO, I have with me tech entrepreneur and world traveler, Dan Zavarotny. Thanks for, for coming to the show, man. Hey, Jason. I really appreciate you having me on. Yeah, this is cool. And today we're talking about how to turn your idea into a 120-person team in 2.5 years, which is a very exciting topic. First thing I want to ask you is, how do you turn your idea into like a two-person team? <laughs> <laughs> well, forget forget 120 people. What about yeah. just getting a co-founder? Like, how do you you know? Because that's one of the biggest things people ask me is like, how do I get a co-founder? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the first thing people do is they forget that they they always look at people who just like themselves. So you always see like a sales guy getting a little sales guy to join him, or engineer getting an engineer. So I think the first thing to do is understand what is your actual skill set. You have to be aware, very self-aware and understand what is it that I'm good at. Once you have the understanding, then you could start looking at people who are different than you. Um, in any business, really, there's kind of three high-level areas, which is build something, whether it's an offering, a product, whatever it is. It's sell that product. Uh, and once you have those two things going, then it's maintain that revenue once you have that revenue. So I realized that my background is a little bit more around uh, marketing and sales area. Uh, so I said, hey, I need someone who can build, which is an engineer. Uh, like, and then we have. I, someone, I would say normally it's usually like a, a CTO is what you need for you're like the VP of marketing type person, and then maybe there's a CEO that is more like fundraising and business side. Yep. Those are usually the three hats, right? The CEO, yep. CTO, and VP of marketing, or yeah. CMO. Some people say. <laughs> Although funny enough, though, uh, my co-founder he was an engineer by background, and but he's also entrepreneur for many years. And so when we started, he said, "Okay, I'm going to build. You sell." And I said, well, I, I don't really know how to sell that well. I'm more of like him from finance strategy. And he said, then what the hell are you going to do? Right. <laughs> oh, he's like, well, you got to go figure out how to sell. So that I got to sell um, with That's a budget good. of zero. So we made some progress. And then we, since we're a health nutrition app, uh, we had to get someone who actually understands nutrition, which is maintain the revenue when someone actually signs up. Uh, and so we got an expert nutrition dietitian who also came from technology companies. Um, but I, I think you said, how do you find these people? You have yeah, because because I mean the, the 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 thing is is you can like find people to help you build your company up, but if you don't have a company in the first place, yeah, then you're just hiring people and like having yep. them like help you build it. So I guess it's more like how how are you effectively going to grab somebody who, like you said, does the things that you don't know how to do and mm -hmm. is okay with helping you build those up, right? Yep. yep. So I mean, I think as I mentioned, first up is I figure out what am I missing. Once I figure out what I'm missing. Then I go to places that I don't hang out with, but these people hang out with. So, you know, if I'm finance guy, I'm going to go to finance conferences. Uh, but if I need a technology person, go to CTO conferences, uh, go to CTO networking events. Uh, there's a lot of different communities. Like every city usually has one, like Chicago's 1871. There's Y Combinator. There's Techstars. Uh, there's actually like even founder dating. That's a thing, right? Uh, cities promote that because they want people to join forces. So you have to find people that are interested in this topic because you can have someone who will say CTO who's brilliant, but he doesn't want to work for a startup. He wants yeah, to work for a He's too busy. Yeah, he's got, he's got other things. He's got so many offers on the table, whether it's Facebook, PayPal, Google, or whoever, or yeah. he might have his own idea and he doesn't want to yeah. work with you. <laughs> so <laughs> and you have, thing, you have, exactly to, you have to entice him, right? Yeah. And that's the thing. And I think, how do you uh, do that? How do you incentivize? Like well, a first brilliant I, mean, CTO? I think it's one is you have to meet them where they're at. Like everyone is in different station of life and people sometimes think that, oh, hey, I can convince a person to do this X, Y, Z with me. But you got to remember, like, you can't sell cats to a dog person. It just doesn't work. And so you have to make sure this person is already excited about starting companies. This is why I always say like joining communities for like, like early entrepreneurship communities that just have people like just hang out, go on events. Um, like every, if you type in right now, you're in Philly, Jason, I'm in Chicago. If you type in Chicago tech events, you'll find hundreds of little communities that just people literally go and hang out and network. And these people are also looking people like you. And they're, well, I'm looking people like them. That's one of the better ways. Another one is actually, and I hate to say it, but people you already know, your friend circle, really dig, you know, digging deep and find out who your friend circle is. Uh, the guy I started with, we were friends from 10 to 14. And oh, we wow. took a break from 14 to 30. <laughs> <laughs> that is so common, though. That happens so often. Well, yeah, because, you know, you get a little older. And you like, get I'm older like, and you, you realize it's hard to make friends. So who are my older friends? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it, the break part is people always say, like, wait, we took a break for 16 years. But like, again, I went more like the finance route. He wants an engineering route. So right. there are different circles of people. But then as you start connecting, you know each other from back in the day. You kind of understand each other's style. Um, you realize adults are a little different. But then it becomes more of a personality match, right? right? 
but and that's so I think it's really just going out. But it's not being it's not being able not being afraid to getting rejected. That's really the key. I mean, just like when you try to find a girlfriend, a wife, a partner, a boyfriend, whatever it is. Still trying, you know, man. Still trying. Yeah, and it's uh, <laughs> lots know, of yeah. rejection. We gotta keep going. Right? As long you as gotta keep, keep going. Trying. That's the thing. Like, and people. I mean, it's, I talked to a lot of uh, venture capital firms. They always say that, "Hey, do you have a co-founder? Do you have a co-founder?" That's one of the things they really care about because they realize like they want to can't convince. If you can't convince one person to join you, how are you going to convince anyone to become your customer? Like, how are you yeah. going to convince other people to join your company? Like, this is the most important person. You can't figure that out. Um, and so it is. It's just like going on hundreds of little lunch dates, coffee dates, people. And understanding one how smart they are. Number two, like, do they want to work with you, and do you mesh well? Yeah, um, and I, and I think that's a great point. Is you mentioned if you can't get brilliant team members to join you, then investors are not going to want to invest. But I want to figure this out because this is a common uh, challenge that people face: is they found a CTO who's brilliant, they found a VP of marketing who's great at social media marketing and whatnot. You're good at business and and promoting and fundraising, but you still can't raise money. Mm-hmm. Is it because it's the wrong investors, the wrong market, the wrong time? Is are, do do they not kind of resonate with your culture and your yep. vision? Like yep. what what are the other challenges of raising money for startups? Yeah, I mean the one that I'll tell you it's and it's important to mention. There's two a lot of times we hear all these stories about these successful entrepreneurs raising a billion dollars from Silicon Valley from the top VC firms. You got to remember like. There are a few people that start in these groups that like the Stanford, the Harvard graduates who worked at Google and Facebook. If you fall in that group, then you probably have much luckier time. But there's very, very few you know, of those people, those people around. And if you're the normal person who may have just wanted to hustle and bustle and was smart, but hasn't had the opportunity to just go to Stanford, um, then you have to realize that you're starting behind and you're playing catch up. And just being self-aware about that, that's okay again. You know, people always like compare themselves to like, oh, but Bill Gates at this by this age, or Mark Zuckerberg at this. Like Bill Gates' mm-hmm. father was already yeah. a millionaire, right? Uh, <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg went to a high school. There's a feeder for Harvard. Yeah. Well, like something like 50% of people from this high school went to Harvard. That's and he had already blowing. built some minor yeah. software applications when he was like 12 or whatever. So yeah. he, he already mean, had a jump start on it. It's it, People forget that. Like I remember my gym teacher at the same time was my political history teacher in high school. And their teachers and like their classes were like former U.S. senators. So it's important yeah. to remember, you're not comparing yourself to these people that you read about in these articles that are published in TechCrunch or Crunchbase. Yeah. You've got to compare yourself to where you were yesterday and are you moving forward? So that's yeah. step number one. Um, and then number two is, it's just, again, it's networking, networking, networking. Um, one of the things- how, like, do you, how do you do that during the pandemic when like most of the technology events are probably canceled or now remote sure. on? I just did one last week ca- called Diversa Tech. And it was a really, really, really fun meetup. Lots of people checked it out. But it was me and a couple of panelists and then people chatting. So I couldn't see anybody, couldn't shake anyone's hands, yep. couldn't really hear anyone pitch anything. So it was very kind of, it just reminded me yeah. of like an AOL chat room instead yep. of like yeah, a yeah, yeah. Tech, tech conference, you know? So how do you get so past that? I think you start off with a couple things. One is angel investors. And also you got to start off with other founders. So it's people who are a year or two years ahead of you. So one of the things we did, for example, uh, we started applying to different syndicates, AngelList. Like you can just submit an application to AngelList. Mm-hmm. They like it, they pick it up. Um, and there's hundreds of AngelList syndicates, right? And you have people who are like super angels, like Jason Kalkanis, one of the mm-hmm. early investors in Uber. And they basically just submit applications. And a lot of it is just like, the, again, the grind of just, I'm going to keep submitting until someone picks it up. And but when also, you su- when you submit these applications, who are you submitting them to? Uh, these are people on AngelList who say, hey, I'm a former founder as well. I've exited. Now I want to invest and give back to the community. Gotcha. I'm going to get, like, I'm, on, I'm going to invest $10,000. I'm going to get 100 of my friends all put in $10,000 and it becomes a bigger check. Gotcha. You know, and they are much more founder friendly versus the venture capital firms. Like, oh, we're giving you $2 million. We're going to, you know, they're looking for every- Series A or Series B and yeah. taking a huge chunk. And so you, I, yeah, I, want, I want to go back to what you talked about before about getting your team put together and the culture. And this is a big thing for a lot of people from what I'm hearing is the disconnect between founders and team and employees and not understanding how to work together. So why, how and why is culture so pivotal to the success of your startup? How do you create the culture and kind of make sure everyone's on the same page? Yeah. So I think... It's important to mention culture right now versus culture later. Uh, I was talking to a founder recently who was super successful. It's something like a $10 billion IPO now or something. Jeez. It's crazy. And he actually said, we talked about the idea of people at different stages. And like in the early stages, he, we called it, everyone's crazy. 
Uh, and then as you get further, you get like 50% crazy people and 50% like normal people. And then as you get bigger and bigger in IPO stage, you're like 99% normal people, only 1% crazy people left, right? Makes sense. Uh, because like for you to go quit your company job or your high level, you know, or go from corporate world to startup, like you have to be a little bit crazy. Yeah. Um, and so that's number one. Number two is also in the early days, everyone's a generalist. You want as many generalists as possible. And as you scale farther and farther, you want more specialists and less generalists. Um, and so think those thing, two things are very important to know as you're looking for people. But what's also very important is to be very, very clear about your values and your culture to everyone you try to hire. Um, you want people to come in with like, hell yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm okay being here for 80 hours a week, even though the average corporate life is 40 hours. Because yeah. shit will happen. You will have some crazy days and you want people who are there. Like we are so transparent during our interview process. We tell them things that are just terrible about our company that other companies try to hide because I don't want people to be surprised. Yeah. Um, the worst thing you can do is someone joins your company and then for two months, they're just like, oh my God, I want to get out. Right. And you think you're trying to, and you spend time teaching them, onboarding them, and they're just trying to leave the whole time. And like corporations, that they're used to that. They don't care. But for you, you're just like, this is such a drain of time. And yeah. then you have to restart the ser you know, search again. Over and over have, again, yeah. And that's the cycle people forget. So I would always rather scare someone off because they're and show them the bad stuff and be totally transparent versus them join and try to leave afterwards. So be extremely transparent about your culture, and it's okay. We have this thing where everyone who goes through our process, um, they, I mean, oftentimes people just drop out. They're like, this is not for me. And we're like, great. Thank you for not having us do six more interviews. Because it also saves time in interviewing people as well, because interviewing takes so long. It really does. You know, I'm going to tell you something I've done I, because I have a startup now. It's an old startup, but we just redid it again. So one thing I did to speed up that process is two things. First, I created a lot of videos, one being a founder video, one being a tutorial video. The next being um, already having our social media up and running to show like what our branding and vision is. So they can come on board, look at our videos, look at our content, say, I get it. Next thing I did was create an onboarding document, not too long, not too short, somewhere in the middle that says, here's the tools that we use, here's how we do things, here's our culture, our vision, and that's pretty much the onboarding. Then they sign a contract, NDA, whatever. So yep. for us, it's more about giving something up front so that we don't have to do that in the interview as much. Yep. The, inter the interview is more of a 15-minute let me see if I like you. Let me see if you can talk and let me see if you can answer two or three of my questions and then yep. you're in. Let's just yep. start this thing, right? So let's talk about the main topic, right? How do you take what I have right now, which is 10 people in a startup that is not yep. funded by VCs or anything and scale it to the next level? Because that's what everybody wants to know. Mm -hmm. So I think the biggest thing about that is number one is you need the right generals in place. And this is where you have to do two things. One is they have to bury people right now, but also they have to be willing to go the 10x. They have to also get better. And people sometimes forget they might get someone who's incredible at marketing, going from zero revenue to, let's say, $100,000 in revenue a month. But zero, 100000 to a million a month is a different skill set. People forget that. And so you have to, one, once you have those people in place, you have to, uh, you have to basically get them more skills. So one of the things we did is we sat down and we tried to teach all our managers how to recruit and how to hire themselves. Uh, because remember, like a month ago, they were individual contributors. Now they're managers. And now a year later, they're directors. And now all of a sudden, some are VPs now, right? And so you have to constantly upskill them in new levels, new skills. People forget that. Um, there's a famous uh, saying that I've heard recently that basically said, like, HR person goes to the CEO and says, hey, we're spending $10 million a month in training. And people leave. Like, <laughs> we're wasting this money. They go to our competitor. And the CEO says, what happens if we don't spend any money and then they stay? Right? Yeah. That's and not, so the idea yeah. is like you have to upskill your employees all the time. And at a startup, you have to do even faster. And okay. really, all those skills you have, which is basically onboarding, recruiting, um, you make sure they value their employees quickly and make it, things very data driven, is something they have to learn. And you just have to push them toward that. And I think it's important to do that because you run out of time. Like I was able to get the first time people. After that, I just simply, it's hard for me to talk to other people. And how can I go and recruit and you know, do the other 110? And it's making sure these people who, Unfortunately, maybe sometimes, maybe not the superstars we're used to, but how do you make them superstars? It is very, very important. And the, the worst part about it is uh, sometimes you have to hire above them too. Right. And people have to be aware that like there are opportunities. You might've been the perfect person for the first two years in this position, but sometimes you do some, get someone above them who may be their boss. Or somebody yeah. comes along, like I might have a good manager, but someone comes along who brings a value and they add something to the company that they can't add. 
that they yep. they don't have the skill set for, but this person does. And sorry, but they came in and they're going to take over this this thing, you know. Yep. So I understand it, and it's and it's hurtful. But everyone has to understand it's all about the company. It's not about us. Can't yep. take it can't take it personal. It's just business, as they say. So um, well, one of the things we do is we give most people equity, and so stock options and equity. We get stock yeah. options, yeah. So what yeah. happens is people the as they thing. see yeah as they see value in it, and they want to earn they want to earn a profit. They want the company to take off and become bought out by someone so that their stocks are worth yeah. money. So yeah. It's all about team effort here. So it sounds like you've done a lot of stuff for NutriSense. And um, where can people find out more about it? And do you have any kind of uh, giveaways or anything that you want to sure. tell, tell the audience? Uh, they can check out by going NutriSense.io. That's N-U-T-R-I-S-E-N-S-E.io. Uh, and if you use Jason's code for $50 off, you can sign up for any program um, and check out what we do. Also, we have a ton of free blog information about nutrition. So also don't feel free not to buy anything. We're happy with that as well. Our goal is to really educate people on their health so they can live a longer, healthier life. So check out the website. Awesome. And I'll put that code. It's Jason Sherman, $50 off. I'll put it in the in the description for NutriSense.io. Dan, thanks for coming, man. This was a blast. Appreciate it. Thanks for having Ho me, Jason. Hopefully some people learned some good stuff here. Sounds and as good. always, we will see you in the next episode.